Good evening. I'm Lori Rabishaw, the Executive Director of La Grua Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our conversation this evening as part of our Local Treasures series. La Grua Center's mission is to engage community via arts and culture, and we do so by presenting a variety of concerts, art exhibitions, and speakers on a wide range of topics. We are now presenting these events as best we can on digital platforms like tonight's chat on Zoom. We usually start with a little housekeeping. So I'm coming to you from LaGrua Center's office in Stonington, Connecticut, and our program director, Kelly Rocherol, is behind the scenes from her home office nearby. We welcome your questions and ask you to write them in Zoom's Q&A feature on your screen, and we will get to them after our guests have chatted a bit. Our discussion will be recorded and available on the Grua Center's YouTube channel in the next week or so. This is also the time when I take a moment to thank the many people who donate to La Grua Center's annual fund each year, and I know some of you are with us tonight. Those gifts are a big part of making our year-round programming possible, and those annual fund dollars matter more than ever during this time of COVID when many of our usual activities are curtailed and we can't come together in person. So now on to our talk. I am acquainted with Cormac O'Malley and Chris Keppel, but not in tonight's context as filmmakers. And so I will ask them to now unmute themselves and come on camera. Gentlemen, they are here with us to tell us about their collaboration on the documentary entitled A Call to Arts about Cormac's parents, the photographer and sculptor Helen Hooker and the author and Irish war hero Ernie O'Malley. And the film just won the Audience Choice Award for documentaries at the Mystic Film Festival last month. We're delighted to have Cormac and Chris with us to chat about the process of producing the film, as well as the stories of the people in it and behind it. And Cormac, I imagine it must have been so very interesting for you to take back a look back at the two people you knew as your mom and dad and how you came to learn about their extraordinary contributions to Ireland and to the world of arts and culture in the last century. The film has several airings in the next couple of weeks on CPTV, and I, for one, can't wait to see it. So welcome, Cormac and Chris. Take it away, gentlemen. Thanks, Thank you Lauren. very much. Chris, over to you. OK, um, thanks to everyone who's come to share this um, little chat with us. Um, we are going to start our talk about the film uh, tonight by um, sharing the preview for the film. So bear with me while I shift to presentation mode. Um, it's hard to come up with another couple in Ireland at that time, or indeed since, who had the same breadth of interests and made the same range of contributions to art, to sculpture, to collecting and encouraging painters, to photography, to archival work. They were both extraordinarily prolific and energetic. I'd never met an Irishman, and this absolutely dedicated face that I'd never seen, like a cliff or the prow of a ship. I caught it in the portrait. It was simply fascinating to me. But he came just three sittings, and I was so in love with him at the end of the third, I never finished it. <laughs> Helen was an artist ever before she met Ernie, so one wasn't depending on the other. I mean, it was a combined effort. It was a kind of golden period in Irish modernism. So many artists would not have existed without her patronage. I could still see the light, the tremendous light that was in the studio. We were engrossed in all sorts of conversations about all different subjects, and to do with Ireland, to do with everything, and with the arts in general. I will never forget the intensity of her gaze. There were two artists who met together and wanted to bring a dream together in, in Ireland. We were very excited to see that because we hadn't seen work from that period by a woman before. The door is open here. You don't have to open it. It's been kicked open by Helen. <laughs> Of 
Cormac, that's our preview. Um, and I, is everyone able to see us? Are we back um, presenting as each other? Great. Um, so Cormac, do you have a question for me to get started? Um, yeah, well, how did you get involved? Yeah, that um, that happened when you invited um, Trish and Tanya from the Gallery of Photography, the uh, directors and curators of the Gallery of Photography Dublin, over to Stonington to explore the O'Malley Archive and invited me for a very spontaneous uh, interview, video interview with both of them um, at the end of their investigation into the archive. And they were excited about um, the discoveries that they'd been making and their reaction to the images and their excitement about the images in uh, an Irish arts context and a modern arts context, I think was a signal to me and I think to you too that um, there was a lot of room to explore and a lot of potential uh, to develop a, a conversation and an exploration of this subject matter um, in film. So that for me was really uh, the beginning there, beginning in the basement of Water Street in the uh, in the archives. Um, well, we ha had some. Uh, we had a, a little bit of a um, track record, so to speak, just before uh, that, because um, I had inherited a large collection of my mother's photographs, but I had no idea what what was in there. And in uh, 2014, uh, Christy Brown came up and started looking into my archive. And as a result, we got a book out called Western Ways, which was photographs of the West of Ireland. And when we brought that back to Ireland and gave an exhibit, um, some of the galleries sort of woke up and sort of said, wow, she's a great photographer. And then uh, when uh, Trish and Tanya came out here, we started digging some more. And the idea came up that we might do a major um, exhibit uh, at the National Library of Ireland, as well as the Gallery of Photography, which Trish and Tanya run. And so that allowed us the venue, so to speak, and the, uh, to create a book called uh, A Modern Eye and uh, to give uh, legitimacy and, and reputation to my mother as a, a photographer. And in the course of that, we sort of said, well, we're going to have all of these events in 2019. Um, why don't we film them? Uh, and so, you know, that's really uh, how you, Chris, uh, had uh, done some work earlier. And then we said, fine, let's let's challenge ourselves to make a movie out of this. It really, I mean, stepping into that um, stepping into that moment in Cormac's life where the culmination of so many of his efforts um, and really which was the continuation and the culmination of his parents' efforts. Um, it was a wonderful place to arrive, a full, a rich uh, landscape of very fully developed ideas um, that had been refined uh, in Cormac's work with different historical scholars and the work that he's done on Ernie O'Malley and more recently with artists and um, art historians uh, on, and ph photographic historians on the work that um, he's done on his mom, Helen, and, and people who are interested in sculpture. So entering the, I've been working with Cormac a little bit on helping different aspects of the archive, but entering at that moment and seeing two new exhibits in Dublin and a new book um, and, and renewed interest from the National Library of Ireland in uh, the archive, there was a lot of excitement and buzz. And it really just felt like the natural thing to start to turn on the camera. Um, and I was amazed when Cormac made me aware of how many people were alive in both in the United States and Ireland, and, and particularly in our region in New England and New York, and then um, in Ireland within driving access of Dublin, who knew Helen and who could talk firsthand about um, their relationship with Helen and their uh, interaction with her at various stages of her artistic career. So it, it just, it was a, such a, such a, a serendipitous moment um, that Cormac and I were able to come together and he was able to lure me away from a somewhat dull job into a much more exciting job uh, for a year or so. Thanks Cormac. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your, what was your biggest discovery on that, uh, on that journey that we made together? 
You know, for, for me, who's someone who's interested in the fine arts um, and has been for a long time and, and without boundaries in, in, in interested in visual art and in writing um, and also interested in history and um, in the history of conflict and revolution. And I think in the O'Malley archive, we get this wonderful conversation uh, where a political moment, a revolution and a, and a fight for freedom in Ireland uh, are, are in, they intersect with uh, an artistic expression of that um, fight and of that uh, spirit to celebrate an, an independent Ireland and, uh, and an Irish and, the, and what really the heart of Ireland was as far as Helen and Ernie uh, sought to understand it. Um, it was as Cormac and I work on Ernie's journey, the series that we um, have been doing for some time on Ernie O'Malley's um, journeys through the war of independence and civil war, Ernie writes frequently about the soul of Ireland and about what um, the fight for that soul is and, and how the people uh, have took it upon themselves to wrestle for, for a strong feeling of national independence and national identity. And I think in many ways, seeing Helen and Ernie's legacy, it's the legacy of that teamwork to take that goal further, you know, to transition from, uh, you know, a call to arms to a call to arts. Uh, and there was our title. Um, and it was as simple as that. Once that title came to us, then we never uh, turned back from it because it always took us to the intersection of, uh, of ideas that we wanted to be in for this film. Well, I must say, I, I uh, like the way that you had at the start of the film, I forget where it is now, but I've seen it so many times, but in that Ernie, my father, was turning away from his revolutionary past because he had said that his future is going to be in the arts. And uh, my mother, who uh, wanted to be an artist, but was uh, raised in sort of a, a socialite atmosphere between Greenwich, Connecticut and New York and had been a national junior tennis champion at age 18. And she, she really just wanted to be an artist and, and uh, get away from it, uh, all of this social relationship. And the irony was by running away from the community in which she had been raised by having met a, an artistic character like my father, who was by this time writing his memoirs uh, and had been a poet and uh, was published in um, magazines here. Um, when they came back to Ireland, they were bringing all of the sort of modern concepts um, uh, from both in terms of photography and sculpture um, and, and uh, theater to Ireland. And th they had a ball. Um, they were well liked. Uh, father uh, was a national hero in a certain sense, so it was easy for her to get an introduction. But you know, introductions only go so far. You have to be a character who is liked. And I think you know what you were able to capture um, um, in the film here was in a series of people who really told what their relationship uh, was uh, with my mother, the sculptor or photographer. Yeah, and, and I think watching you um, get to discover some new um, details and some new perspectives on your mother um, by meeting the, her colleagues in the arts, whether that was in sculpture or in um, textile and fashion design, and we didn't get to include, that's an interesting thing to bring up is that we did not get to include uh, a number of Helen's artistic pursuits because it was it would have diluted the the film and the photography was so abundant and so strong in its application for film so the film sort of to told us what it needed in that sense and we had hoped to to include her wonderful um paintings drawings her theater design and maquettes her fashion design but we had to settle for her sculpture and her photography um, and her fascinating relationship with Ernie O'Malley and her children. Um, and that was one of the sort of unexpected gifts uh, of the film was, you know, setting out to really document an artistic legacy and discovering um, a really meaningful personal legacy um, that Cormac and his brother and sister were generous enough to share uh, with everyone. Um, so thanks for that, Cormac. Well, it, it, it was a family project, not uh, in the sense that, and uh, my brother and sister had never actually talked about uh, many of the incidents and I wasn't present 
for their interview. We just thought that would be the best way to have the interview proceed. And so I had no idea what my brother or sister were going to say or had said to, uh, uh, to Chris until we sort of saw a, a cut of the movie later. And I thought there was great pathos and great understanding. Um, and you could see the various segments of our lives uh, both together and then when they were kidnapped and brought to America and, uh, and then after after my father's death to see the emotional toll, uh, positive and negative under all of these circumstances. So I think in a very poignant way that uh, the film actually uh, tells several stories. Uh, my, my own journey of discovery, uh, the uh, my family's uh, discovery, as well as uh, my mother and father's relationship uh, in the arts. And really what makes it all so appealing is the fact that all of this was well received. I mean, you know, if, if you take the characters like uh, Patty Maloney, uh, head of the Chieftains, I mean, a lot of people in America know the Chieftains um, as, a, as a band. Well, you know, um, uh, here, uh, my mother is sculpting Patty Maloney. Cormac, you know? let's go. Let's go to our. Let me share screen again. We have a photo and a sculpture of Maloney that we'd like to share. If we can be, sure. if I can be successful in this, which I hope I can once more. Um, so here is. We can, we can talk through uh, the sure. slide slideshow if you want. Yeah, well, I've got a little... Uh... Helen O'Malley, now, uh, I met, uh, it was an exhibition here in Dublin, and, uh, uh, you know, she was telling me about New York, and she was talking about uh, doing a sculpture she loved to do uh, my head for some reason, you know? And uh, so uh, when I was in New York, you know, I met up a couple of times, and she was a member of a, a sort of a famous club there on Fifth Avenue. Uh, she was able to see the, the parade on St. Patrick's Day going up and down, you know, right from the window, <laughs> which was fantastic. Uh, but then, you know, she was set up here in Dublin at Lansdowne um, Mews. And uh, uh, so going on, there's uh, a, a photo of Patty that, oh, there's a photo of Patty that um, Helen took. Cormac, go ahead and resume. Uh, introducing us to Patty as we look at this photo. Yeah, so th this would have been in my mother's uh, studio in uh, Dublin. Uh, not so much a studio, just where she lived as a, in a small little apartment. Uh, and she made her living room into uh, a home where people would uh, come and visit and uh, people like Patty Maloney would come <laughs> play uh, play the, the tin whistle or a flute or, um, and, and others would perform and she would just uh, be uh, sculpting him. And uh, Patty was very amusing in terms of, uh, he didn't quite know what was to be expected, uh, nor what the outcome would be. But he was really very satisfied um, with, um, and of course, this is all uh, uh, many years ago um, in about 1975. So um, Patty was uh, much, much younger then than he was uh, in the interview as we captured him. But they, uh, uh, um, uh, he, he gave the spirit of what those uh, meetings were like and what her studio was. And uh, I thought what was very imp Im impressive was um, he he and, and the other people uh, just sort of said, you know, she concentrated on the art and she was able to, amazingly enough, uh, be, be able to speak and yet capture um, a, a head like this. And this would be an early section of the head, uh, not quite finished, um, but, uh, Patty only came twice in two two uh, settings, uh, and uh, then she would uh, finish the sculpture later on after they've gone. He would take she would take some sculpt some photographs of him, so that when he he left, he she had some images to go back and look at. Um, uh, people, Cormac, should we go and uh, since we're talking about Helen and sculpture, should we visit uh, a John Bean sure. photograph and and include him in this conversation? Here's um, here's John Bean, 
Um, and here is uh, Cormac hard at work interviewing <laughs> John Bean. Uh, Cormac, you want to take it from here and introduce us to John Bean? Sure. Well, uh, John um, was uh, a sculptor, but also uh, to make a, a living since the arts are not always very uh, uh, profitable. It's very, very hard to, uh, to get a start as an artist. And um, he uh, went into foundry work. So the foundry, uh, he went over to London, learned the foundries, and then he brought the technology which he and Leo Higgins um, had uh, uh, come to learn in London. And he said, why don't we open up our own foundry? So here he is, uh, the, the man in the back there with the berry uh, on his head is uh, John Bean in his own um, uh, casting uh, place in Dublin called the Dublin Foundry. And it was the first major foundry in Dublin to be created. And um, he uh, uh, started, uh, that was uh, in about the 1970s. And um, it was nice for him because he got to meet the artist. He got to uh, have a mechanism whereby he could do his own uh, art. And just to say who, who he is, there's uh, many uh, of, on the program may have seen the marvelous famine ship which is now placed in the United Nations out in their garden. And John Bean was the artist who did these tall, thin uh, figures who were starving and the, and the ship, which you can see through. And he was so uh, emotional in the way that he was able to capture these images. So he had a great time and appreciated uh, mother. Um, and they sort of, uh, she, he really liked uh, the way of her attitude to the work. Uh, he praised her for being a, a highly professional person. And in fact, uh, very demanding. Um, and the, one of, that was one of the things that, uh, because I'd never seen this other side of my mother's work is uh, I'd, she'd done ahead of me and uh, um, that, you know, I came and went from the studio. But to see how somebody else perceived what she was doing, it was fascinating. And after the interview, we got to go back to John Bean's studio and see pro projects in progress, which was a big treat for Cormac and I. This had to be one of our favorite interviews um, that we did. Cormac, what do you say we go over to see a quick picture of Yvonne, and then we'll look at a couple sculptures since we're talking sculpture. Um, you want to introduce this um, very fine lady? So Yvonne Davis is the curator um, of the various uh, collections at the University of Limerick. And um, before my mother died, she agreed to give a set of 45 heads of sculpture um, uh, to the university. And um, so um, th they are on sort of permanent uh, exhibit. Um, uh, here is one, for example, uh, Mary Lavin, who, uh, though born in America, she became a very prominent short story writer uh, in, in Ireland, a good friend of our family. And um, she, uh, um, I think she did this uh, head in probably two or three settings. Again, um, it's it just a remarkable talent when you can see how somebody can look at a person and then just uh, absorb them. Uh, there's another head, I don't know if we have it here, of De Valera, which, well, here's Sam, uh, Sam, Sam Beckett. There's De Valera, right? Here's De Valera. So we, a uh, fascinating story on the De Valera side was we went up to uh, the president's house in Ireland, Arison Uktaron, and um, I had a, a session with him, brought my wife, uh, Maura, and my mother along. And um, she had not, uh, she knew De Valera, en passant, so to speak, uh, but had never, uh, he had never agreed to do a sit, have her sit for a portrait. So um, she came up and said, I want to do the head. I don't think she told him. And she was very silent throughout the meeting which lasted about three quarters of an hour, a good Irish cup of tea. And we went home and she immediately said, I'm going to do a head of sculpture. And so uh, in the hotel room beside her, she, um, she created a studio. And in 48 hours, she did this, uh, this head. Um, and uh, and you, you can see, I mean, it's Rodan-esque in a certain sense, because it's a very lively head. It, it, you can see the vigor that she 
uh, brought to and applied with, uh, you can almost see her, her finger marks on the clay as she applied it. Um, it's uh, deemed a, a very good portrait of him and it, uh, it sits in some distinguished uh, houses uh, back in Ireland. That's and a, a co copy of it is also down in, the, in New York University Glucksman Ireland House. Um, since we're visiting famous Irish uh, people, can we visit Ernie O'Malley's um, friend, Samuel Beckett, one of my sure. favorite writers? <laughs> I yeah. love this sculpture. Um, well, she had uh, um, uh, um, met Beckett in, in um, Paris in uh, 1936. And one of the fascinating things about archives is um, you don't actually, uh, uh, she had mentioned this to me perhaps once, but I so somewhat forgot it. I knew that father had a relationship, but I never knew when my mother uh, met uh, Beckett. And by going through her poetry, of all things, um, from her estate, I was able to find a poem uh, written uh, by her about Samuel Beckett. And so we have the text uh, and the reference to her uh, meeting Samuel Beckett back in 1936. Um, when Beckett died um, in the, uh, uh, I'd say it was early 70s, um, she kept saying, I always meant to do ahead of him. And so though uh, she didn't have uh, Beckett sitting for her, as she had so many others, um, she had uh, photographs of him and she had her own memories of him. And so um, she, she constructed this, which I think is a, a, brilliant, uh, a brilliant head of, uh, of Beckett. I really agree. Um, Cormac, what do you say since we're in the slideshow, why don't we visit a few photos and sort of take ourselves to the end of the slideshow and then we'll We'll sure. say um, adieu to our audience. Yeah. You want to say something about County well, Mayo Man? <laughs> yeah, this is uh, the, the Mayo Man. Um, it, it's uh, what I call is uh, it's uh, a Yeatsian, uh, Jack Butler Yeats, uh, did many characters like this uh, back in the uh, early 20th century. And um, she uh, did a portrait of uh, what she called the Mayo Man. And um, before she died, uh, there was an awful lot of sculptures in her Greenwich studio. And uh, I think we had about 300 of them. And um, I told her that I wasn't going, you know, they'd be thrown out if she didn't cast it. And um, uh, this one, uh, she didn't cast. I'm not quite sure why, but uh, I said to myself, I will, um, I'm going to cast it. So. I, I just thought it was such a, a spectacular character. And, you know, the motion, it, you can see this man walking down the country. Um, it, he wouldn't be in the present day, nor in the, even in the 70s, but it's an image of the earlier period. All right. And one last image of a younger Helen uh, with a beautiful sculpture of an earlier style, much more um, sleek and, and a little less Rodin-esque as we like to say. Can we move on to some photos since we sure. have limited time? What do you think? So yeah. the first group of photos um, is are from Kilmainham Jail, a place that uh, Cormac has visited many times. Cormac? Yeah, so Kilmainham Jail is the Bastille of Ireland. And uh, my father had been incarcerated there uh, by the British um, in the war, Irish War of Independence, and also uh, during the Irish Civil War, uh, when he was fighting against the government after had, there had been a treaty. You can see the fortress-like attitude of, of this uh, 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 prison. And uh, he spent um, some, some very bad days there. Um, he was... Um, uh, living under the atmosphere that he might in the first instance be identified because he had given the wrong name an alias Bernard Stewart. Um, and they were very, he was very afraid that they might actually find out who he was. And so he arranged uh, to escape from uh, Kilmainham prison. Um, one of uh, the uh, four people to have escaped during the war of independence, a uh, remarkable feat when you look at that, uh, uh, incredible building and its size. Um, well, this is just such a great example of Helen's camera and her um, bringing uh, visual interest and mystery to a very 
uh, mysterious and exciting moment in Ernie's life. Um, so reanimating uh, an old story with a with an inspired uh, view of Kilmainham, and she did this in at the Four Courts, where Ernie had has a legend and a and a historical uh, significance, and other places around Ireland. Um, we've got a photo that we'll have to show because it is um, one of the most uh, most universally loved photos of Helen's archive thus far. You wanted to tell us what we're seeing in this uh, photo? Well, this, these were uh, uh, a, a farming family uh, down near where we lived in County Mayo. Um, and um, it was picked uh, when we had this exhibit last uh, year. Um, there was a banner made of this photograph, sort of 15 feet by uh, three feet and blown up. And um, in the several exhibits uh, that have followed since that first exhibit, uh, people have, have picked this particular photograph. Uh, so here you see uh, on the right would be uh, the grandfather. Um, uh, the, uh, on the left would be a granddaughter, uh, then the son and a grandson. So when we show this uh, photograph down uh, in, uh, in the newspapers, um, the, uh, the uh, girl's grandson came up to her and showed her the photograph because it was apparently located near Berishul, which is where these families live. And uh, the, the, the lady who is now 78 looked at the photograph and said, don't you know who that is? And the grandson had no idea. And he said, that's me as a 14 year old. So, I mean, it was a beautiful story. And she was, uh, when we had an exhibit um, in February this year before COVID hit uh, in Ireland and closed the uh, exhibits down, uh, she was the big star at age 98 uh, in the Museum um, of uh, Country Life in Castle Bar. But it shows uh, the indomitable spirit and sort of possibly the frustration of why are you taking this photograph? But it's a great I character. Image, I think this image should be in the Irish Museum of Modern Art. Uh, it, would, it's, it's, it deserves it. Let's look at a photo of Helen uh, walking adventurously down to a well-known bridge that we got to visit uh, in Ireland in our travels to Newport. Um, do you want to say something about this photo? Yeah, this and then I've got a contemporary photo of the bridge. This is what we call the Seven Arch Bridge uh, off the Berishul River. And it, you can see it's uh, at low tide. So uh, the fresh water from the Salmon River uh, upstream is coming down through the bridge. And those trees behind that um, uh, bridge are on our property. And uh, so my mother was doing uh, that. My mother and father spent uh, three or four years weekends really uh, uh, over that period, uh, going through uh, around Ireland. So they would be taking photographs of uh, monasteries as well as infrastructure. Um, um, and uh, here's a, a more modern one. Um, this one just snapped on that trip, but since you're going into other photo subjects, let's pass through some other photos. Well, these are Currics, which are uh, the um, Irish, uh, uh, when, when you go fishing in the west coast of Ireland in the early 20th century, this is what you would go fishing in. You go fishing for sharks, which would be larger than that Curric, and uh, you would uh, tackle them. Very interesting, if you look at right behind them on the shore, there's a whole bunch of old Currics, uh, you know, and a Curric is actually made out of canvas and has put over a very light frame of wood. And you're going out in rough waters to uh, go fishing or go on transport wherever you're going. And uh, you're pulling away um, um, in um, difficult times. Um, but this is an, an island off the course uh, called Inish Boffin. And uh, again, one of the things that people, any tourist going to Ireland will remember the bog scenes that they've seen. And uh, in this photograph, you can see uh, the pattern of how you uh, cut the small um, piles of, of uh, turf and then they get bigger and bigger. And the purpose is so that they can get dried before you take them into the home. And there's a shrinkage factor in, in uh, each cut. The, it shrinks by about uh, 60%. 
and so it's pretty heavy filled with water and then you put it up and uh, then you bring it home and this is what you uh, use throughout the winter to heat your house i assume that that is a pile of turf too isn't it uh, yeah that's that's a pile of turf ready to go yeah. in and 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 be kept uh, and you know you would use it for cooking as well as uh, uh, you know, in our home, we would have uh, a fire in each room because it's pretty cold and damp in the west of Ireland. I hope the and, resolution is coming through on these um, for everyone. This is just a beautiful portrait of a family, um, as Helen would find would bravely uh, interact with seemingly almost anyone in her uh, photographic adventures. Love this image as well. Yes, she had the, I mean, whether she was in Japan without any uh, knowledge of Japanese or in Russia uh, or in Finland, she was able to get people to pose for her, but it wasn't a formal pose. And again, she used her charm. Um, uh, these are uh, two little uh, children in, in Ireland. That made the cover of my uh, book, The Western Ways. And uh, you can see definitely uh, uh, the young girl sort of frowning, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> the boy is quite happy to be in the limelight. <laughs> Probably because he's admiring the beautiful Helen Hooker, um, uh, Helen O'Malley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love this photograph. Can you, do you remember where this one is? So this is Kildavert uh, uh, Castle. The castle actually is an O'Malley castle. It was uh, by uh, Grace O'Malley, or as we call her locally, Grania Whale. Grania Whale was um, uh, one of her reputations as being a pirate queen from the west of Ireland. She got into difficulties with the law because she was very independent and she uh, was known as a pirate and um, she would attack British sh ships or demand that they pay bounty and uh, if not suffer the consequences. Um, and one of the things that she had was these what we call keeps or castles um, placed strategically around the bay of uh, Clue Bay in the west of Ireland. And um, they're high enough so that you could see out to sea um, and uh, see who is approaching you. Um, so this was, uh, this was one on Ackle Island, uh, Kildavenet of uh, Grania Wales Castle, built in the uh, middle of the 16th century. And Grania Wales went over to see Queen Elizabeth to plead for her son in uh, 1593. And uh, there should be a, a movie made about that. These are more uh, local um, scenes, uh, regattas. Um, and so she uh, was able to, uh, to catch the social pattern of people. Um, so Cormac, we're almost out of time. So we may as well mention the broadcast on Connecticut public television and some of the dates. The one I'm most excited about is the, um, the Sunday evening at seven on November 22nd. But if you want to stay up late and watch it, you can see it uh, as the premiere on Connecticut Public Television, November 16th at 10 p.m., The Late Show. Um, and then we've also got Saturday, November 21st at 9 a.m. So have coffee with a call to arts. Uh, go ahead to the cptv.org. It's Connecticut Public Television's website. They've done a great job promoting the film. Um, they even created a 30-second promo for us because of, we have a long two minute uh, trailer that we use regularly. Uh, here's an action shot from the COVID influenced Mystic Film Festival where we all wore masks and uh, had a great time and, and entertained 30 or 40 people and nobody got infected. That was wonderful. <laughs> um, here's Cormac and I on stage and that's our last uh, slide. So I'm gonna stop this screen share um, and hopefully uh, you're back seeing Cormac and I and no longer um, seeing our presentation. Um, at this point, Cormac, if, you, if it's okay with you, I think I'd like to invite uh, Lori to come back. Sure. Because um, we've used up 40 minutes and we want to be respectful of our audience. <laughs> I'll come back and see if we have any questions. I see we had somebody with a hand up. Um, and I wonder if I'm going to allow her to talk. It's Betsy Osha. Oh, Joy. Betsy, <laughs> Betsy do you want to um, 
Let's see if I can get you to, if you want to unmute yourself, you can speak. I didn't mean to do that. I just saw oh. a little because I was watching. I forgot, even though I paid my money today, but it was wonderful. Those pictures are fabulous. It's very, very exciting. And I'm so proud of both of you. This is just wonderful, wonderful stuff. Wonderful. Thank you, great, Betsy. Great job. All Thank right. you, Nate. Thank you. Yeah, that'll teach you to push a button. <laughs> um, I'll take this opportunity to ask a question, um, Cormac, because I don't know much of your backstory, and I'm quite fascinated, but I guess there are books about it. But tell us a little bit more about your mother and her sense of adventure. You mentioned Japan and Russia and Finland. We're talking kind of about the middle of the 20th century. Oh, most much earlier. Much earlier. Or, or even earlier. Most women weren't doing that. Now, you know, obviously if she was a huge tennis champion at 18, she probably saw more of the world and was more perhaps sophisticated than many women. But would you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, well, actually, the world of tennis uh, in uh, 1923 is nothing like what we think of uh, tennis where the world uh, opens. And she only went to the um, uh, American um, uh, nationals. And uh, but she won at age 17. Um, she won her uh, doubles uh, national junior tennis championship. And the next year when she was 18, uh, she won the singles and the doubles. And then um, she just threw the tennis uh, uh, racket down on the table and told uh, her father, I'm not going to Vassar uh, the way my siblings have and the way her mother did in 1894. And um, I'm just uh, put the investment in me as an artist. And uh, so that took them all quite a, quite a back. Um, and she uh, took, uh, you know, uh, they set her up in Greenwich Village and she could go uh, as long as she played tennis in Greenwich. Um, a, a different, you know, there's a difference here between Greenwich Village and Greenwich, <laughs> an enormous uh, difference. But so she'd go out to Greenwich to her home um, in, in the, on the weekends and play her tennis and go back to her art world. Um, and then from there, she went off and she said, uh, fine, I want to go to Paris and she studied uh, uh, with Bordel in Paris and sculpting and then um, she spent a year um, down in Greece uh, dancing. Um, she wanted to, she and her sister wanted to, saw that there was a possibility of going to the Soviet Union um, and they'd, they'd known very little about the Soviet Union and they were not interested particularly in politics. But they knew that their father hated the Soviet Union because he was the chairman of the um, Anti-Communist League in America. Anyway, um, um, and then they pleaded with him, please don't send letters to us with your name on them uh, mm -hmm. because the KBG would figure out who they were. Anyway, so uh, they went off uh, to get a visa. They had to go to Sweden and then to Finland. And then they got their visa in, uh, in October 1928. And uh, she loved Russia and the churches and this whole thing and spent six months studying art and uh, doing paintings and uh, wandering around Russia, not with any political intent or sociological study or whatever. Well, it yeah, she was studying through art. Mm -hmm. um, and she met Pavlov and uh, she uh, found an American uh, scientist there. Um, anyway, she came home and after she met Ernie O'Malley, um, her family did not encourage that relationship. And so I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was kicked out from dinner at the dinner party on the first day. Um, and ironically enough, um, their fight was my father had lived out in New Mexico and knew exactly what the um, American American Indian conditions were. And the discussion came up and was quite um, deemed to be disrespectful as to my father's description of what he thought about America's handling of the indigenous American Indians in in America. And he sort of said, that's just what the British did to us. So he had an affiliation based on knowledge, unlike my, my grandfather, who was from upstate New York and thought that they had handled the uh, indigenous problem quite well, sort of segregation and, and forget about them. Anyway, and she landed, that's how she landed up in Ireland, went around the world, uh, took a, a trip with her mother to Japan 
and uh, uh, took her camera with her and uh, uh, spent three months in between Japan, Korea, and uh, um, uh, China. So one of these days, we'll have another book out on, on that voyage, which was really very exciting. I can only imagine. I'm going to invite anybody else in the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, you can write it in the Q&A. Or if you want to raise your hand, we can um, unmute you if you'd like to. Anybody there? Uh, Jim Quinn, I'm going to allow you to talk. Can you ask un unmute yourself, if you would, Jim? Hi, Cormac. How are you? Hey, Jim. Say, to what extent was your mother part of, if at all, sort of the um, the international art movement that was occurring during those times? I'm thinking of Stieglitz. I'm thinking of George O'Keefe. People like Helen Frankenthaler, um, Louise Bourgeois. I mean, was there this sort of um, internationalism or this this cadre of of really forward looking artists that that she was a part of that she was um interacting with during these years well um actually no she was a, she stuttered and so that was a a tremendous inhibition in her social outgoing qualities um and so one of my theories is uh, she took to individual uh, sports or individual artistic things which you can do and produce a product um and and not have to speak or interact about mm -hmm. them so uh, on the other hand you know due to my father's uh, contacts when he was over in america uh, he happened to know paul strand and edward western and, and uh, george o'keefe so they did in fact meet but there was no sense of a, a cadre or a deep affiliation or something that they kept up in terms of um, the communication subsequently. What I think she did do is she was very inspired by the O'Keefe work. And um, that was, you know, the, the epitome of modernism. And so uh, in the light touch of color that uh, Georgia had, um, my mother's principal medium was watercolor. So not that she had a great influence from Georgia, but she was able to pick, and certainly in modern, some of the later sculpture, uh, sorry, photographs that she did in the 1970s in, in Mayo, uh, there was just the, um, uh, the carrot, you know, or the shell, which could have been a Western uh, uh, shell or a Paul Strand. And she did photographs. So though she wasn't part of the group, Jim, she was uh, cognizant of what was happening in the world. I think, well, and also it's worth mentioning, I'm sure Cormac will uh, reiterate that she found herself immersed in a group of modern artists in Ireland, um, you know, that Ernie had connections to, including Jack Yates and, and Mamie Jellett and other modern painters and sculptors and writers who um, were forming their own scene in the sort of isolation of World War II. And we heard from several of our contributors um, what a what an ironically beautiful moment that was for modern arts in Ireland, uh, partially due to the isolation caused by the war. Yes, I mean, she, she was, um, she got on famously. Um, and, you know, uh, we got rid of the stutter because she's fallen in love and now married and settled um, and uh, found her man. So, I mean, that just gave her uh, the, quote, freedom, you know, that that helped everything. And she's also coming into Dublin and she's able to, uh, she attended a local uh, art school, uh, the Metropolitan uh, School, and um, it met a lot of the local artists there. But their dinner table would be, have uh, people like Frank O'Connor or Frank Aiken and other people who she, or Paolo O'Donnell, whom she would sort of politely whisper in their ear afterward, would you be free for me to do a sculpture of you? You know, and of course, ah, oh, Jesus, that would be grand. No, and uh, uh, the next time, uh, the next would be, how soon can you do it? <laughs> no, so uh, I'm putting on a little thing, but uh, she had, she was so at home uh, in 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 Ireland, and um, I'm sure she regretted. Uh, the marriage broke up, and uh, one of the questions that she had is, should she leave Ireland and come to America? She had guts enough, you know, to stick with her initial uh, attitude was, the marriage is over, I'm going to leave. And she went out to Colorado and started a whole new uh, um, uh, 
art out there and she did westerners and uh, after when she died i must have been brought eight or ten uh, sculptures out to museums in in colorado because she had done them when she was out there in colorado springs i love that that she uh really continued her career and just changed continents and went off and i think this documentary really gives us a chance to learn more about her work and we all know that you know generally speaking women artists have been less represented in the public eye for many years and i think there are a lot of efforts to remedy that and i think this film certainly does that and of course your father's fascinating stories are written about and we see a different aspect of him it sounds like in, in this yeah. film too in their partnership my last set, last thing I'd like to express is just, you know, compliment Cormac on his bringing Ernie O'Malley's writing to more people and the historiography he's done. And Ernie O'Malley is one of the finest nonfiction writers of Ireland in the 20th century. That's why people like Sam Beckett were drawn to him. That's why um, films have been made. That's why Ken Loach seized on Ernie when he made The Wind That Shakes the Barley. And, and to that text, that inspired me to want to work with Cormac um, needs to continue to be discovered. And Cormac's done great work uh, in his mining the text, uh, making sure it stays in publication, doing other uh, work to explore Ernie's perspective through his letters. And we, you know, we hired a wonderful Irish voice actor who reads passages, beautiful passages uh, from Ernie's work in A Call to Arts. And, and it's one of my favorite parts of the film is really that we were in a limited way, able to bring Ernie's writing to life. Well, that sounds like a wonderful place for us to end this conversation. Um, so I thank our audience uh, for coming in with us, but mostly I thank you, Chris, for the film and Cormac for you, your willingness to tell the story and perpetuate the lives of your, your parents who are uh, such wonderful artists. And uh, I'm, I personally am eager to do some more reading and of course to watch the film. So I invite you all to uh, Google Connecticut Public Television and, and again, uh, find that film. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And thank you again, Chris and Cormac. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori and Kelly.